I started Wildlife Works um, with the idea that if we in the world want wildlife, initially the idea was if we want wildlife, we have to make it work for the people who have to live with wildlife. Um, those of us that live in the United States really don't have that issue very much anymore. The wildlife that was inconvenient for us to live with, we dispatched long ago um, to make our lives convenient. And, um, but in many parts of the world, for many different historical reasons, there's still quite a bit of inconvenient wildlife around. Um, and that wildlife had retreated to those parts of the planet that were previously uninhabitable. So generally, wilderness uh, was, were, was areas in which there weren't people. Or if there were people, they were people who had also sought escape, essentially, from the masses for reasons of persecution or, or preference. And so you had these areas that were wild around the world that were wild and were habitat, therefore, for wild things. Uh, and they were wild because of the absence of us, to a large degree. And forests were one of the main places that were wild because of the absence of us. Forests uh, aren't particularly great habitat for, for our species. We can't eat trees. The interesting thing about trees is that we, we can't live without them because they, have, they perform a daily miracle of transforming a toxic gas of carbon dioxide into a, the oxygen that we need to survive and that all life needs to survive. So we can't live without trees, but generally we, it's hard for us to live with trees. Uh, forests prevent sunlight from reaching the ground and sunlight reaching the ground is essential for us to grow many of the things that we eat to sustain us. So, Generally speaking, even when you find people in forests, they've cleared patches of the forest in order that they can actually farm the things they need to survive. So we have this funny uh, relationship to forests where, where that we can't live without them, but we can't really live in them. And so our, our historical uh, reaction is whenever they're in the way to human development, we clear them and we use the land for what we consider to be more productive uses. Unfortunately, Mother Nature had a design in, in creating forests in the first place, and the fact that we've cleared so many of them already is now having repercussions to our, our own sustainability as a species on the planet. And I think that we're starting to finally come around to recognizing that that fundamental miracle that trees pr provide, which is to clean the atmosphere and reduce the temperature on Earth, is something that we all need, not just the, the wild species. Um, and why this has become a particularly prevalent issue in, in our times is, is a sort of convergence of a number of quite positive developments for the human species that have resulted in our increasing ability to survive in different environments. And the unintended consequence of that is that the there be dragons uh, patches of map, maps have, have gone, essentially. There is no such thing as uninhabitable anymore on this planet because with our creative minds and our uh, use of technology and to a degree better medical care, better education, we've figured out ways to live in places that were previously uninhabitable. And one of those places and how to make use of those places that we thought were previously uninhabitable by mechanization of deforestation that can now remove very large areas of forest very quickly uh, in a way that is, um, goes unnoticed in many ways. I don't think you, you read the statistics, and they're just big numbers. But and when you see a, a shocking picture it, of, a, of a formerly beautiful forest that is now non-forest, it, it, it has a, an impact. But it's impossible to show the, the scale that it's really happening at in these large forested areas of the world. And so, and so this, this change in our interaction with those wild areas is creating new problems for wild species because those wild species went there to escape us and now they've found we've showed up again as bad neighbors. And, uh, and so for us as a company, the original intent was, gee, you know what, there's no point wringing our hands. This is it's a, just a fact of our evolution as a species that we're, we've moved into this, this new realm where there's so many of us and we're so good at what we do to survive on this planet that we're having a devastating impact on the natural ecosystems. And, uh, and the people who are suffering most, in, funnily enough, in many cases, are the people who 
also fled into the forests to live away from the way that we live our life and the way that we have developed the planet. And so our focus as a company was, you know what, the, 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 our responsibility first and foremost is to those people that live in and around forests to make sure that the forests work for them and to make sure that they're not clearing forest in order to achieve the basic human needs that we all take for granted. Wherever you are in the world, whether it's Latin America, an indigenous group in, in the Amazon, or Southeast Asia, or the Congo Basin, you know, people want the same things. They want food. They want shelter. They want education for their children, so their children have a better chance of a different life uh, than they've had. They want health care, so that they're, they can be healthy in their environment. And generally speaking, they want work. They want to feel like they're productive members of their community or their society. Um, so those are the basics that we find. And as a company, we made it our job to try and find out how to provide those things to communities that were struggling to, to find those resources without destroying their natural environment. So we, we made it a, our job to try and bring solutions to shelter and food and health care and education that were sustainable, that were inherently not going to involve destroying the environment. And, and it, it, uh, people ask, you know, well, how did you do that? What ideas did you walk into the community with? And, and, um, and how did you convince a community that they should change their behavior towards a sustainable path? Um, you'll hear a little bit later from um, a, um, a very honored guest of ours today from the community. You heard a little bit from her in the film. Um, she's much better in real life, um, Mama Mercy. And she'll tell you a little bit about how the community is engaging with our activities there. But the important element for us was really not to try and come in with all the answers. The important aha moment, really, for us as a, an organization, um, and I think for anyone involved in RED it, that has a, a, a serious intention to scale this thing globally to solve a, the very serious problem of deforestation, the serious learning is that Forests are being destroyed for their economic value. They're being destroyed for their economic value, not necessarily to the highest value user, but there's always an economic reason, down to a community that's cutting bush to plant corn that they know won't grow because the rainfall doesn't come anymore because of climate change. <laughs> but they do it because they don't have a better idea. And for them, that's their best chance, they're the only idea they have to generate value from land. And that same principle holds true for agribusiness giants that are clearing five million hectares at a time to plant soy or, or cattle. It's, it's an economic value that they perceive in the forest. So to combat that, we have to provide an economic value to the people who, who are living in and around the forest first and foremost. We don't necessarily have to compete with the value that a timber company in North America can generate from logging in the Amazon. We don't necessarily have to compete with the value that a, an agribusiness giant can generate from growing soy in Indonesia. Because in the end, it's the local people and the regional and local governments that will decide whether the value that we're producing for them from their forest is an adequate substitute for the, the destructive use that, that was going on. And this won't come as a huge shock to many people here, that most of the value in commercial use of forests on large scale does not accrue to the local people who live in the forests. Uh, it goes out of the forest with the product that's being produced to serve our needs in general or, or uh, growing communities in, in other parts of the world. So competing with the needs at a local level is actually not that difficult because they don't get that much value out of their forests. And they don't have very many alternatives. So, but, so the trick is, and this is where red has become so, so powerful, I think, the value of red in the, in the way that it was envisaged within the, the global arena, the value of red is, is based on the emissions that it reduces. So firstly, there have to be re, re, a real threat of emissions from a forest. And, and you'll hear a little bit more in a minute from our, our Vice President of Technical uh, of Carbon Development, who's the technical member of our team, who actually has the, the scientific background to, to do the real difficult work that we have to do to prove that this forest is threatened and to prove how many emissions would come from a forest. Um, and it's a little esoteric. Uh, a ton of CO2, carbon dioxide, you'll hear that phrase, you'll see it on slides. A ton of carbon dioxide occupies a, an air, a volume about twice the size of this room. So the gas, 
which you know, no, people think of gas not weighing anything, but it, it weighs something, and, uh, and a volume about twice the size of this room is, will be, would be one ton of carbon dioxide. Um, trees, of course, are, are, they grow by eating carbon dioxide and breathing out oxygen, and, uh, and they don't grow from the soil. You'll, you're, you'll see some interesting um, quotes about that from Jeremy's talk. But, so, um, so we have to quantify very scientifically, the emissions that would come from a forest. And the value of those emissions is based on two things. How big the forest is, both in terms of surface area and in terms of the size of the trees. The bigger the tree, the more carbon is stored in the tree. So that's the first element, is how big is this forest that you're trying to protect that's under threat? And then the second element is how threatened is it? So the more threatened the forest, the more likely, the higher the likelihood that it's going to result in releasing its carbon to the atmosphere in, in the near future. So those two elements, how big the forest is, how threatened it is, are what creates value in protecting the forest. So we as a company go to the biggest, most threatened forests we can find because that creates value that we can then pass on to the communities that, that live in and around those forests. Um, so that's the, the economics of a RED project comes from quantifying very scientifically so that it's so that when an organization that cannot reduce its carbon footprint decides that it wants to reduce its overall impact on the planet, it, it's buying a real emission that was prevented somewhere else. And in buying that real emission, it's having the same atmospheric impact as if it had made an investment to reduce its own footprint further in the United States. So that's the most important element of what we do in reducing threat to forests that are that are truly threatened is that there's a reality to the emissions that would occur otherwise. And we have to demonstrate that to the satisfaction of international auditors everywhere we go. And you'll hear a little bit more about how we do that. Um, but the real work is actually what goes on in the community because the real work is actually then transferring that value to the community in a way that allows them to develop the, and meet their needs, those basic needs, but in a sustainable way. So some of that involves knowledge transfer. Some of that involves agricultural practice, uh, learning about how to grow things more intensely on the land you already have so you don't need more land. There's certainly that. But much of it involves just providing the community with the financial incentive to make those decisions for themselves. If you create enough value in them protecting their forest, they'll figure out how not to need the forest anymore. And it's only when they start figuring out how not to need the forest that it actually works. It, because there's not enough of us, nor enough money, to stop them from using the forest if they want to use it. And so the, the trick is to just provide them with enough incentive. Sure, you know, bring in, build schools. They don't, they, they don't have the wherewithal to build schools. You build schools. They need health uh, supplies. You bring health supplies. Um, you, whatever they ask for as a community, whatever they want, you, it's our job to try and figure out how to use the carbon financing to provide so that they can make that decision as a community broadly, not as individuals, but as a community broadly, that protecting the forest is more valuable to them than destroying it. And so the, the, the work that we do in the communities, so, side by side, you know, our teams that go into these projects, they're committing themselves long term. We, we, our projects are at a minimum 30 years long. And the, we usually put one, at least one person into each project to run the project, and that person has the expertise to understand all the dimensions. And they're making a multi-year, in some cases, in the case of the gentleman you saw on the film, Rob Dodson, he spent 20 years in that community. And he'll spend the next 20 years in that community trying to help them develop along this sustainable pathway. And it's that continual work that uh, is needed, really, within these communities. But the, the, the communities themselves become the best agents of change once they decide that it's in their best interest. And I think that's the key thing about RED done right. If RED's done right, it's creating the right incentives for the communities to make their own determination. Whether that's a, an indigenous community in, in the Amazon, uh, and we do work with indigenous communities, and so it's, it's uh, clear to me that indigenous communities are making their own decision. They've made their own decisions for 40,000 years. They're making their own decision about whether they want to participate in RED or not. And some do, and some don't. And RED is not a one-size-fits-all solution for all of the environmental problems of the world. But it's a very good solution. It's a good solution that has, in my 17 years of trying to find market-driven solutions for landscape conservation, it's the best solution I've seen in all that time.
And, uh, but it's not, it's not uh, demonstrated that it's going to be a solution that can scale to the size of the problem. We've seen slides about the size of the problem. You saw uh, the millions of hectares every year. Roughly 7 billion tons of emissions come from deforestation every year. 7 billion tons of emissions. So that's a lot of emissions that have to be reduced. Um, but, and people, you know, uh, one of the things that frustrates us a little bit is that in the policy arena, they think they have to create the solution to that problem all at once with a stroke of a pen of legislation that they've solved the 7 billion ton problem. And, you know, those of us that grew up in the private sector realize that markets never develop that way. Mar somebody has to be an entrepreneur and start the thing this big, and then they have to show other people that it works to be that big, and then somebody will bring some more money and do it that big, and that'll work, and then somebody will bring a lot more money and do it that big, and that's how things develop generally, and, and, and we don't jump to the 7 billion ton solution, and I think trying to figure out the 7 billion ton solution is missing the point. It's missing the point that the solution actually will be Will, will happen village by village, community by community, forest by forest, throughout the world as more money is put into solving this problem and more communities get to move down a sustainable pathway. But it does need more money. So the, the goal of this program, if you like, and of our, of our having initiated uh, Code Red uh, as an industry association to promote Red more, uh, shall we say, less self-servingly than our own promotional activities for our own organization, are that are because we really feel that we're at a tipping point in as a species in our interaction with forest. There is now, we believe, a solution, and it 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 has all of these complexities that you've seen and we've discussed. But actually, the interaction of a of the marketplace to that solution is quite simple. You have a carbon footprint. We all have a carbon footprint. You have a choice about whether you reduce that carbon footprint through your own actions or through offsetting. You can all decide to write a check individually, collectively, as companies, organizations, and governments to solve this problem. The complexity is how you take that money and actually make it result in, in a reduction in emissions and a protection of forests. But that's where the many... Uh, very skilled people involved in this program around the world uh, come in. So we need more scale, uh, and we need the corporate marketplace, we believe, to step up to leadership because they understand that it's not necessary to solve the problem at 7 billion ton level without showing that it works in a, in a, in a smaller scale. Um, and, uh, and we believe that, uh, you know, um, clearly if you're in California, the requirements of California's climate initiatives and California's legislation have to first and foremost serve California's citizens, of course. Uh, legislators are elected by the citizens of their own governments. Um, animals don't vote is a thing I say oftentimes when people say, well, how, why, is, why is this happening to elephants? And I'm like, because they don't vote. Uh, you know, the people vote. And you know, if they don't have a better idea, they're going to push the elephants out of the way. Um, and foreigners don't vote is another truism. So foreigners are not going to elect California's uh, legislators. So in many ways, a legislative agenda has, has inherent challenges to step beyond its provincial needs and see the bigger picture and participate in the bigger picture. But California has always been a bellwether for sea change, both domestically and internationally. So we, we have great hope that California will play that role again in showing that legislation can play a role in creating a supportive policy environment. We're not expecting public money to solve this problem uh, at all, but we are expecting public legislators to create a supportive policy environment that says, if you want to sort help us solve this problem, we like that, and we'll do what we can within, within our domestic limitations to assist you. So we need the, the program exists. Uh, there are, it, it exists in, in many countries. Um, you saw the maps. Um, and the, the program is, it, um, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution, but it's a, it's a flexible solution that fits many environments. And I personally have visited dozens of forest communities and forests over the last five years. And, and I, I know that they, you know, you go in first to Colombia and meet with an indigenous group, and you think that their, their needs are going to be very different than the needs of Kenya or, 
or the DRC, and then you, you spend enough time with them and you realize that actually they're not. You know, they're, they're those groups that are embracing the idea of change in red as a way to support, manage change within their culture, uh, their, their needs aren't very different. They, they're, they're struggling to provide for the needs of their community in the ways that they've traditionally done. And it's not uh, their fault, it's, it's our fault. We've changed the rules on them and, and, and in doing so, uh, we've created an environment where their traditional cultures are struggling. So, so Wildlife Works is, is engaged in many places. There are many other great actors. Um, you're going to hear from some people today who are those pioneers in, in getting outside their parochial interest and in providing finance for uh, these kinds of programs um, around the world, including uh, some of the people that have been directly involved with our organization over the last few years that we're, we're very uh, grateful to. Um, and the message I would say is that, that we, are, we are really just at the beginning. Um, but that we're, we're at a moment where we can choose to go down a better path. And for the first time, at least in my experience of 17 years, we have the attention of those people in the countries that have these big forests in order to get their support in going down those paths. I, I, I was with the Minister of Environment for the, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, that's formerly the Belgian Congo, or Zaire. It has the second largest rainforest uh, on, on, the, on Earth. Um, and, uh, and it's a country that is, is 186th on the Human Development Index out of 186. So it's, it's, it's dead last in the Human Development Index. Uh, and they're dead last because they have not ever really benefited from destructive use of their forest to fuel their economic development. And they haven't done it in early years because they were a colony. And so the destructive use of their forests in early years fueled the growth of a European country. Uh, the, and in recent years, they've had political turmoil. So you know, in, in a country where there's civil war, trust me, I know this, you don't want to go into the forest with a chainsaw, just in case somebody's in there with an AK-47. So you tend to avoid forests. So forests don't get destroyed much during war. And so the Congo is now coming out of war, and it's in a and it's now in a in a point where it, as a country, has to decide if it's going to use, as Brazil did, as many as we did, as uh, is it's going to use its forest estate to fuel economic development for its citizens, or is it not? And it has a decision to make. And the minister, when we presented to him the results of our RED program that we have in the DRC, and we showed him how much value that could bring to the citizens and the, and the government, he basically said, if you can deliver this kind of value from protecting our forests, I don't need any more logging concessions. So now, you know, does the world need more wood? Yes, it does need more wood. Does the need more, world need more wood from tropical primary forests? No. We can certainly survive without destroying any more primary tropical forests. <laughs> but it's not up to us to make that decision. It's up to the people who, who control the destiny of those tropical forests. And it's up to us to provide them with economic alternatives so that they can meet their development needs without the going down the destructive path. So I, I hope you'll all uh, stay engaged in this process and in, in red in general in one way or another. Uh, I know many of you already are. And, um, and we're here to uh, be a conduit for those solutions to those people. And, uh, and I'm here for the rest of the day. Uh, and um, I'm happy to answer questions at the end of the day if there are questions uh, that arise. But um, for, that's all I had to say. And, um, uh, and I, this thing went off a long time ago, Dave. So I might be you know, way over time or way under time. So the screensaver was not a good idea for the clock. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, um, but I, do, I do want to say that on a very personal level, I think um, it's inspiring to me to see so many uh, brilliant people from so many different walks of life coming around the same concept. It is the, that's one of the, the elegant aspects of RED is it, it is, yes, it's complex and has many dimensions, but that means that you can bring lots of great people with lots of different perspectives into the solution. And I think that, that uh, for me, it's inspiring to see so many of them in this room, and uh, I hope that we can continue our, our relationship into the future. So thanks very much. And <laughs>